Okay. I'm going to call the meeting to order then. It's a regular schedule. <laughs> Nothing regular about it. It's a regular scheduled meeting of the Town of Berlin Development Review Board. Uh, we have one applicant before us tonight. It is um, 707. Uh, and um, uh, the applicant is Jean, Jean and Donna Gagnon. Uh, actually, Good Haven, uh, Good Samaritan Haven. Um, and it's for a um, site plan review, a major site plan review. Uh, that's the only application we have before us. Um, I'm going to ask those that um, intend to give testimony in this, before this board tonight to please raise your right hand. And do you swear to tell the truth? Nothing but the truth that matters before this board tonight on the penalties of perjury. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because we are still remote, uh, I'm going to ask people to announce their names as they speak. Um, uh, it's sort of part of the roll call procedure. Um, who's going to speak for the uh, applicant tonight, primarily? Uh, well, I'm going to kick things off. Okay, Rick. Uh, should I go to it? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good to be here, although I'll admit I had a, a, a little bit of panic at uh, 7 o'clock. I couldn't find the link for the Zoom meeting, but uh, you, you probably all know what that's like. And uh, 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 as we try to stay connected. So uh, I, I'm going to kick things off and then turn it over to Brian, uh, who's going to lead, uh, lead, lead you through the, you know, how we're going to address the criteria. Um, to begin with, I want to explain the role of uh, oh. down, downstreet housing um, in the project. Uh, uh, we, we're the proposed owners of, of Twin City uh, if the project goes through, and Downstreet is our real estate development partner. And I wanted you to understand that because I think it's very important. One, because of the high quality of the real estate development work that they do. But the second thing, and I think it's even more important, is the type of housing they develop which meets community needs, but it doesn't sacrifice anything in terms of the quality, what it looks like, how it fits in and how it's operated. So the fact that they're with us, I hope tells you something. And uh, because that's exactly what our, what our aim is with this proposal. Now, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to give you some context because, you Rick, know, this is-, Rick, this is May I interrupt you one second? Yeah. I, I, I don't recognize all the parties here on the uh, screen, and I really want to see, do we have any people here that are seeking interested party status? I mean, is everybody with the applicant? I don't recognize. Morgan Brown. Uh, I'm just a member of the public, uh, just interested in the project. Oh, I have okay. no comments. Morgan, are you interested in uh, party status to this uh, no, application? No, I, no, I'm just observing. Well, we appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there'd be no one else uh, that seeking interest in party excuse status. Me, please me. proceed, Brett. Excuse, excuse me. Uh, Thomas Bachman. Thomas Bachman, where's that? Uh, oh, Tom, Tom, Tom is the architect. For, for the he's, the a, he's, architect. Okay. he's architect. Okay. I don't recognize him. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, I'll get I'll get rolling again. Um, I just we think it's important that you have some context. Uh, this is a different kind of project for sure, and I think you deserve to have some of that context. Um, you know, the very first thing is we we are going to continue to operate Twin City Motel as a motel as it has for the last fifty years but serving a, a tremendous need that unfortunately has emerged over the last 20 years. And that's the need for short-term em emergency housing for individuals. I, I'm not sure if you know this, but throughout be, both before and throughout the COVID period, uh, Washington County had the second highest number of homeless individuals by county in the state. And that number has been between 300 and 350. And these are people, so many of them living in motels, some of them in shelters and some on the street. 
Uh, you know, and unfortunately, the facilities that we have here in Washington County, they just don't meet up with the need. Uh, we've been doing our best uh, over the years with a basically a single family house in Barrie and church basements in, in, in both Barrie and Montpelier. So that's the context for why we were even looking um, uh, to, to, to do a project like this. So perhaps now you're thinking, well, yeah, they're going to buy a motel. Is this going to be like the Hilltop Inn? We know what that's like. Um, and my answer is no. Uh, in fact, our aim is exactly the opposite of the Hilltop Inn. We're trying to get away from the Hilltop Inn. So, for example, instead of a 90-unit isolated warehouse, um, we're going to be offering 18 attractive rooms on the bus route with generous common areas for eating, relaxation, and doing the important work of, work, uh, of preparing to get out of there and working on your future with a housing case manager. Secondly, instead of a complete lack of a screening process, which is unfortunately the situation at the Hilltop, we will offer a very rigorous intake process that aims to place our guests where they will fit in best and where, where they will succeed. And I, you, you may not know this, but this is not our only facility. Um, we hope to be offering four different sites by the end of the year. Um, and coincidentally, we didn't plan it this way, but they are in the four major towns of Washington County, Montpelier, Barry, Berlin, and Barry Town. And, uh, and I think that, that um, in some sense, that, that, that does make sense to us that this, that this need is, is, is balanced between the different communities. Um, so I've been pointing out the differences between the Hilltop and us. Another difference is at the Hilltop right now, hey, it's a, they're private owners. They're there to maximize their income. They have hardly any involvement at all with the success of the people in the motel. Um, versus what we will be offering, we will have 24 seven professional staff on site. We'll have case managers as well as staff from other organizations that we work very closely with, like Washington County Mental Health, Capstone, and others. And a footnote to the staffing thing is our administrative staff, like me, our offices will be on site. So we want the place to look good and to be well run, and uh, we will have a big stake in the success of this property. <laughs> and. You know, right now, there's kind of an anything goes mentality in the Hilltop and the other motels. You've really got to do something pretty bad to get kicked out of there. Uh, versus, uh, we will be operating an alcohol and drug-free property with daily check-ins and a very low tolerance for troublemakers. Uh, people will be there. Uh, with a program agreement, they're, 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 they're going to get a room, but if they violate the agreements, they, 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 could, they will be out immediately. So I, I just want to point out those differences. It's because people bring up the hilltop and rightfully so, but this is going to be a world of difference from the hilltop. And I'll close by saying we think Twin City can be something very special, that it will look attractive, be professionally operated, and give the individuals who happen to utilize it a leg up to improve their lives and be productive citizens. So with that, uh, I'd be glad to answer questions later, but I'd like to turn it over to, um, to Brian. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Brian? Great, yep, thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I'm Brian Lee Karnas. Uh, for those of you that don't already know me, uh, I'm the civil engineer for the project with Dwarf Engineering. Um, so I'll just be doing the main portion of the presentation uh, as it relates to the zoning regulations. So uh, I'm going to bring up my here so we can. Uh, oh, uh, Tom, it looks like screen sharing is disabled. Do you think uh, it would be possible? Oh to get boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Right <laughs> <laughs> if it's not possible, we'll work without it. But um, well, you should be getting it shortly here. Oh, yep, got it. Great, thank you. 
Uh, let's see. Let's start with the overhead photos. Has everyone seen the overhead photo here? Mm. Okay. So this is the existing um, Twin City Motel site. Um, the property boundary is right here between the, the existing motel and the warehouse. And then there's the actual property goes up um, a ways up the Barry Montpelier Road and then along the back of, of the um, highway access uh, right of way. Um, so existing on the site right here is the, the sort of main motel building uh, and then these six um, seasonal cabins uh, and then a single family residence up at the top of the hill there. Um, so that's, that's the sort of uh, existing site for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, we're proposing to take down five out of these six cabins here um, and place it with a new five unit motel building. Uh, sixth cabin is going to be retained, but just for storage. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's only seasonal, so we can't uh, use it as a, uh, another uh, motel unit. Uh, oops, that's not the right thing. Here we go. So here's an overall plan of the site. Um, so realize we've changed orientation, so I'll just orient everyone again. Here's Route 302 at the bottom. Uh, this is the existing motel building. Uh, this shaded part is the new proposed five-unit motel, and then the existing um, residence is up here. So um, the existing motel is proposed to be uh, renovated, um, although the exterior of it really won't change any. Uh, and the interior of the house is proposed to be renovated as well. Um, some offices will be added in the garage. Some of the living spaces will be converted to open office and common space. Uh, and then the, the three bedrooms upstairs in the existing house will be used as um, motel unit rooms. Um, otherwise on the site, it's, it's going to be largely the same. Um, almost all the landscaping is gonna come down and be replaced with new landscaping. Um, Slight parking reconfiguration. Um, we're taking out some parking in front of the existing motel to make some new landscaped islands. And then we're adding some parking in front of the new uh, building. Um, the, both of the drive entrances will be reduced in width um, to sort of uh, better define the entrance and, and exit uh, to the site, which means that this central landscaped area in the middle here is actually gonna be uh, significantly increased. Um, just more, a couple more general things. Um, there's no increase in um, living units at the site. There's currently 15 motel units and three bedrooms in the house. And we're proposing to have 18 motel units uh, following the redevelopment. Um, do, 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 do. Um, every, all the um, dimensional standards of the commercial district are met with the exception of the existing motel, which you can, these dotted lines here are the setbacks. Um, so you can see the existing motel encroaches onto the left side set back here. Um, we're not making any changes to the footprint uh, or use of that building. Um, so uh, we believe that that's approvable as an existing uh, non-conforming structure. So that, that's the general, uh, just the project, I'll let the board ask some general questions before I dive into the, the review criteria specifically. Okay. Uh, I guess Go ahead. I have a question. Um, because, because we're on screen, just wait for acknowledgement, please, Josh. Go ahead. Okay. So the um, short-term housing, the housing that's limited to 30 days per occupant, um, that'll, that'll be in the motel units as well as in the three apartments in the, in the uh, single family home? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't call them apartments. They're, they're just, they're bedrooms now. They'll be converted into, into motel units. But yes, uh, all three buildings will be used uh, with motel units in them. But there'll be, I think the, the uh, initial speaker, Mr. Um, D'Angelo said that he would have an office there. That would be an office in one of the, uh, in that in that single family home. Yeah, so there's offices in the single family home. The garage is gonna be renovated with some office space. Um, and that's sort of gonna be like the intake area. Um, there's also an office down in the, um, the new motel building as well. And then there's, the, I think he said that there would be someone on site 24 seven. Does that mean that there'll be a, a, a non-tenant um, employee occupying one of the bedroom units? Um, I, I'll let Rick take that one. 
Yeah, yeah not, not necessarily. They would be in a wake staff there. Um, so, no, we don't have a bedroom for that staff person. We but do the, in, in the office area down at the motel units. There's a space for that office for that person to be in overnight. Okay, because there'll be there'll be someone there from the from the the management basically um, twenty four seven, and they just have to be in some place. I just didn't know where they were going to be. So, okay, thank you, Chair. I've got some general. Holly, go ahead. So I, I guess these are for Rick. Um, so what happens after thirty days? Are they where? Where do these? It sounds like they're kicked out after thirty days, or what? Because that's what the application said. They're there, sort of maximum thirty days. Are they transitioned to someplace else? I'd like yes, like I said, we have uh, we, we um, will be operating three other facilities, and two of them are long term, um, meaning that there's no limit on stays. Um, so yes, they would be, they would, unless they find their own housing and that's actually the number one goal is that we work with people to get them in their own housing or back to their family or whatever, just as soon as possible. But um, if not that, then we can make the switch to one of the other facilities, which has no limit, um, no exact limit on state. The other question is, I know that the place in Barry kicked them out during the day. Basically, they were there, you know, I don't know, five in the evening till eight in the morning or something. Um, is that going to be true here or is are they going to be able to stay here during the day? They will be able to stay during the day. Yes, um, that is a feature of our permit in Barry. It's long precedes me by about 25 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, um, I, we don't consider that a trauma-informed practice when you're trying to work with people and, and stabilize them and, yeah. and, you, and you push them out on the street every day. So that's one of the virtues of this uh, property and the way that we'll operate it. Okay. Uh, Bob, I have another question. This is Josh. Please, Josh, go ahead. You, uh, I think Rick mentioned some common areas, whether it be a, uh, a common room or, or things of that sort. Where are those common areas? Uh, so there's a smaller common area in this portion of the new building here. Um, there's only in the motel is laundry facilities, uh, and the existing motel, I should say. And then the new motel, there's a small common area in this corner of the building. And then the majority of the common space is, is up in the bottom floor of the existing house. I see. Okay. Uh, is that a new building, a single story building? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, a question. Go, go ahead. Polly? No, no it's Polly. Uh, okay. Are those buildings, can, is it connected to the old, I, I can't, is it connected yeah, to the old I'll, building? I'll show you a little closer. Um, it so looks like an odd configuration to me. Yeah, it's kind of driven by the existing um, site grade more than anything. Um, I mean, one, this the uh, the angle of this new building kind of matches the existing cabins. So if you can see this hatched square in here is the existing cabins. Um, and so partly is there's the steep hillside behind here uh, where you can see there's a lot of contour yeah. lines behind the um, so that's kind of driving. We don't want to have to dig out the whole hillside um, to fit the new building in at a, a different angle. Um, so these two buildings are going to relate um, with a very small courtyard in between. So there's a, like a seat wall here at the bottom of the stairs and then a small courtyard okay. for a little bit of a gathering space in between the two buildings. But there's no physical connection, um, you know, built structural connection between the two buildings. All right. Thank you. I have a question with regard to the remaining building, uh, the remaining individual unit. Um, I believe it's called Unit C. Uh, is that you said that storage only? Yes. Okay, so because it, it, it says motel room on here on the drawing. 
Uh, yes, it, that's a um, that's a note that comes through from our existing conditions. Um, but no, it, it will only be used as, as storage because um, the buildings aren't they, they're too difficult to bring up to building code in their current condition. Uh, they don't have permanent water service. They don't have code compliant electrical service. The, there's barely any insulation, and the foundations are um, inadequate at best. <laughs> for um, long-term residents. So the reason we're keeping that one is because there was some review with uh, historic preservation around the project um, because those motels uh, ca uh, cabins were built more than 50 years ago. There was some interest from um, the state historic preservation officer. They've reviewed the project and, and this is what we're doing to retain some of the historic um, nature of the project is retaining the one um, cabin and documenting the, the remainder of the cabins that are going to be removed. Uh, what is the first floor elevation on a building? The new one? No. The that old building that you're retaining that you're using for storage. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have that information. Uh, it's not on the plan, so I don't know that I have it to hand. I think it's one plan. Yeah. Yeah, you um we will get to that when we get to the floodplain criteria here. But if that's going to be used for storage, I think we need to, I think the applicant really needs to know what the first floor elevation is and is in fact above the base, the uh, the 100 year flood elevation. If it is, yeah, I mean, all storage I, I mean, in there would need to be kept above that elevation. We can infer that it is um, by the contours. Um, so if you see, here's a 549 contour running in front of the existing cabin and the flood elevation of the site is 548.5. Um, so it may not be a foot above flood elevation, but it's, uh, it's at least six inches above flood elevation. Have you got shots on it or no? I don't, I don't think we picked up FFE on those because we weren't planning to use them for, for residents. And, and typically, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if Berlin has this provision, but most towns have the provision where there can be, um, usually it's not a whole separate building, but within a building, if there's areas below the lowest floor, they can be used for um, storage, parking, or building access. Um, so, so to be honest, I, I'm not sure that we shot FFE there because we weren't really considering if it was only storage that it would be, um, you know, an issue with floodplain, um, besides the fact that it's actually outside of the regulatory floodplain, the edge of the regulatory floodplain is this um, double dot dash line here. And, and you're not planning to modify that building? No, we're not. I mean, we're going to disconnect the electrical probably from it uh, and the water, which runs over the surface of the ground. And then and it's just storage. And, and, uh, Tom Bachman here. Um, it may end up with new piers. We're not sure what the foundation of it is, yeah, how good it is. So uh, as far as modifications, I think it's just basically stabilized. And we had also talked, even though uh, people are talking about storage, that's probably where recycling and garbage will be using totes. That's, that's what that will be used for. If you're putting it on piers, you're gonna raise it, raise it up, up the first floor out of the base flood? I mean, we can certainly check the elevation. I'm, I, you know, given the existing grade here, the floor of this cabin is not below the existing grade next to it. Um, so I am fairly certain that it is above the floodplain. Um, it doesn't need to be a foot above the floodplain because it's not a residential structure. Um, so I'd be happy to go out there and shoot it and provide you with the first floor elevation, um, the condition of the permit. Okay, uh, thank you. That, that, we may deal with that later, but I just, not to clarify the storage, but it depends on the type of storage that you're gonna have in there. And um, I think we'd like to know that uh, whatever store is being stored in there is going to be easy enough to solve the problem. You just store it high enough so it's off the ground, off the, uh, above the base flood elevation. Yeah, yeah, which I, I honestly, my belief is that by putting it on the floor in there, it'll be above the base flood elevation. But like I said, yeah. I'm I don't always trust contours. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, I, I'm happy to provide the first floor elevation of that uh, existing cabin as a condition of the permit. All right. Um, any other questions by board, other board members or any board member? 
Yes. Uh, questions by the zoning administrator. Rick, I know uh, the neighbor called me with some concerns and I passed that information on to Brian. I think somebody from your organization went and spoke to him. Uh, can, can you maybe just talk about his concerns and how you alleviated them? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I met with uh, all of the neighbors, um, gave them some information. I met with the uh, gentleman who owns the uh, tool warehouse twice. And um, his concern is, is about theft. You know, he explained to me that he, you know, he's a sole proprietor and uh, he's worried that, you know, that somebody could come in there and, uh, you know, grab something and run out. And um, what I said to him is that we will make it, we will do everything in our power to discourage people from going into his business because I don't see any reason why they should be in there. And, um, and, uh, and we will, we'll just do our best to discourage that. Um, uh, I, I, yeah. And, um, I, I will be on site and, uh, I committed to him that we would be right next door. He could call me anytime and, uh, we will stay on top of it. Thank you. Any other questions before we proceed to the criteria? If there are none, then go ahead, uh, uh, Brian, and proceed with the criteria, sort of, I presume, following your uh, letter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, following the letter, the first uh, portion of the zoning that we were addressing was the floodplain, which we already started talking about. So. Um, a portion of the property is within the special flood hazard area. And as, as I pointed out previously, this double dash, uh, double dot dash line here is the, uh, the edge of the floodplain. Um, we submitted a, a profile from the flood insurance study uh, showing that the flood 100 year flood elevation of the site is 548.5. Um, the only portion of any building on the site that's within the flood, uh, special flood hazard area is this office section of the motel. Um, zoom in on this a little bit. Um, so this, the L, there's two floor elevations in here. It steps up at this line right here. So this, this office portion, which is, if you're familiar with the site, is the sort of little A-frame part on the end, um, is the lowest floor elevation. Then it, it steps up um, more than a foot between these two sections, more than two feet. Um, However, this uh, A-frame section is, is a slab on great construction existing, uh, and the existing floor elevation is 1.15 feet above the, uh, the base flood elevation. So um, this, this portion of the building already meets the um, residential uh, requirements for uh, buildings in the floodplain, and uh, substantial improvement of existing buildings is uh, an allowed use in the commercial district. Um, I assume the board has seen the review comments from um, Ned Swanberg. Um, he agreed that it, it uh, meets the, um, the requirements. Um, he did mention if we have any uh, fuel tanks that do end up in the, um, the flood hazard area that we provide appropriate towns and, and flotation, anti-flotation. And, and if that does happen, we may, we may end up with a propane tank over here um, and if we do, we'll provide a tie down pad and appropriate straps and it will be um, underground. So um, safe from movement other than flotation in the, in the big flood. If you do do that, we can submit that. Yes, the calculations. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, and the location request. Yep. It's not, a, it's not a given unless you're telling us that's part of this application. Uh, it's one of those things that we're working through. Um, it's the, this design is on a very fast uh, timeline. Uh, so that's the details that we're still working through, but um, happy to be in contact if we do end up locating a propane tank there. Yeah, I just, and I, and I appreciate that you're working on a very tight timeline and, um, and uh, obviously everybody's busy, uh, but any changes to this plan, including additions of things like locations of tanks, will need to come back come back uh, before the zoning administrator. Yep, absolutely. And Rick, uh, just for your knowledge, I don't know if you're going to be purchasing uh, flood insurance, but 
Berlin is a member of the community rating system. And as such, you get a, a right now it's a 5% discount. I think it'll soon go up to 15% discount on your flood insurance. Okay, good to know. Um, just uh, continuing on with the, the flood uh, criteria, just to mention the new uh, motel building is outside of the floodplain and the first floor elevation is also set at one foot above the base flood elevation. So it's, um, protected. it's protected in both elevation and, you know, cause I know the location is, may change as we change the grading around here. So it's also one foot above the base flood elevation. So that only leaves me with the storage unit and and I appreciate now that it's not being used for habitation, uh, but still, I think uh, I'd like to know what the elevation of that is. And uh, certainly if there's intended for any storage that's subject to um, leachate or subject to damage, um, we want to know it's being stored above the 100 year flood level, mm -hmm. which can be easily accomplished. Um, this is, can I ask a question, Bob? This is Josh. Yeah, go ahead. I don't see so related, so related to um, the flood question, even though the buildings may be outside the um, flood district, if the if the if there is a serious flood, you would have to evacuate the, the motel, I assume, because you wouldn't be able to get to it, right? It are, does the does the does the developer or owner have plans for evacuation? So if evacuation is needed, the house is significantly higher uh, than, the, than the rest of the, um, the site. Uh, so the house is up at 566, as opposed to a flood elevation of, let me just make sure, because I'm throwing in a lot of numbers, 548. So that's um, 18 feet higher than the flood elevation. Uh, so that would be sufficiently high that, you know, it, it, it would well, be no have, water got up to the house, basically. No, but you, you, but you don't have room for 18, 18 tenants uh, or occupants who are occupying motel rooms to move into the single family dwelling. So they'd have to go somewhere. Well, places. sure, of course. I think that would be a, a temporary emergency evacuation situation just to keep people safe. And then they could be moved to somewhere else as soon as is feasible by the um, you know, emergency services or whoever is evacuating folks. Okay. But it is noteworthy that there is no exit route. Once, once you have a 100-year flood, um, Route 302 will be submerged, and there's no other way out of this site uh, for emergency vehicles. Yeah, as, as is probably common to most uh, developments along 302. Yeah, uh, resilient planning tries to avoid that, but uh, understood, but we don't have access to another roadway. No. I just want the owner to understand that, that that is a limitation here. Um, uh, now, the depths of flooding on 302 in my, my history have never been that great that you couldn't negotiate them with a proper vehicle, but still. Don't drive through a flood, Mr. Chair. I know. <laughs> I mean, I should just, you know, to facilitate the conversation, um, you know, in a real emergency, it would be possible, you probably have to cut the fence, but it would be possible to evacuate people up the hill and onto Route 63 from this particular site as well. Yes. And I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just commenting that I think that from a, from a operational point of view, the owners uh, um, down at the, Good Samaritan Haven need to have some thought about what would happen to, you know, where would they evacuate the tenants to in the event that there is a, a flood? I mean, you know, some contingency, some, some arrangement, whatever. If this is, unless you just simply say, well, it's up to the tenants to figure out where they, you know, where they're going to go. But, but there's, it seems to me that this is a, this population needs a little bit more care than, than, you know, what it might be otherwise. So. Well, I, this is Rick DeAngelis. I want to. I've taken note of the concern, and um, I intend to do something about it. I, I totally agree. We don't. We don't want chaos down there. If there's an emergency, 
Um, there could be other emergencies as well. So we haven't got to that yet, but I intend to get there. Thank you. Yeah. The reality, if you look at the contours, uh, there is relatively easy uh, pedestrian access from that site to uh, 62. You don't have to go up the hill. Uh, you just have to walk uh, uh, to the north. Mm -hmm. But uh, just it's something worth noting. Uh, any other questions uh, for the Zoning Administrator? Anybody else? Uh, if not, uh, we'll continue with the criteria. Uh, okay. you, you address floodplain. Yep, so just a quick tour through the general standards. Um, we are proposing it right in this location here, a four foot high uh, fence. Um, I don't know if it's exactly clear what the purpose of this uh, depression is, so I'll just take a second to explain it. Um, when we were working through the review process with VTrans, they asked us to physically disconnect the site stormwater from the, the VTrans own drainage system. Um, and this was their suggestion was to essentially, um, you know, break the drainage pipe and expose it in a, in a, um, a into the air, essentially. Um, I think that is mainly so it is clear whose responsibility is who's to maintain the drainage systems. Um, but one of their comments was they wanted to make sure that snow wasn't getting pushed um, into this depression and then into their, uh, directly into their drainage system. So that's the intention of this split rail fence uh, in this location is to prevent snow from being piled up in this depression. Um, otherwise, there's a, um, a new retaining wall between the two buildings, which will be like a seat height wall around 30 inches um, high. Um, and then I don't know if this was clear in the text of the application, but there is an existing concrete block retaining wall behind the house um, that is failing. Um, so we intend to replace that with a, a precast segmental concrete block uh, wall, essentially in its existing configuration. Go back to the seat high wall you talked about earlier. Where is that located? So that's this right here. Okay. In, at the uh, courtyard between the two buildings. And then there's two short returns up there. It's just to manage grade on either side there. Okay. Um, um, anything else with regard to fences and walls? Any questions on fences and walls? Hearing none. Great. Um, um, we, we, we did mention outdoor lighting in the general standards, but we'll hit that with more detail as we go through the um, site plan standards. Um, so there are uh, special use standards as well in the regulation uh, regarding hotel and motel. Um, so as we discussed, there are some accessory uses besides just the motel units, uh, laundry, office, common space. Um, but those facilities aren't going to be open to the general public. Um, and then uh, there's a requirement for um, uh, gross floor area per room. So with the 18 rooms, the total gross floor area of all three buildings is 7,960 square feet, uh, leaving us with 442 square feet per room, uh, which exceeds the 400 square feet per room requirement in the regulation. Um, and as we mentioned previously, length of stay is going to be limited to 30 days, uh, so it won't be classified as an extended stay hotel under the regulation. Questions by the board? If not, we'll move ahead to the site plan standards. All right. Uh, parking and loading is the first site plan standard. Uh, so uh, the regulations require 16 parking spaces for this use. Um, we're proposing uh, 21 spaces, including two accessible spaces. Um, essentially, we've got one accessible space at the bottom. Um, the, this unit uh, here is uh, an accessible unit, uh, including access to accessible laundry facilities inside this building. So that's why this one's located here. Um, we have another accessible space at the top because there's not, with the existing grades, it's not really possible to make an accessible walking route from the one set of buildings to the others. Um, so the intention is because it's going to be staffed all the time that if, if someone needs someone with mobility uh, challenges uh, needs to access the, the house at the bottom, they'll be driven up to the other um, accessible space. Um, all the 
spaces are nine by 18, except the ADA spaces, which meet ADA requirements. Um, and minimum 20 foot aisles for two, two way circulation. Um, everything will be paved and striped. Um, we don't expect any deliveries other than your standard parcel service, mail, UPS, FedEx um, kind of delivery. Uh, we've got a few specific snow storage areas uh, that are shown on the site plan. Right, right. Uh, just yep. are you, are you, do, you, do you feel it's going to be necessary to repave or? So we're going to, there's a lot of regrading that happens with this building. Unfortunately, a lot of this is going to be repaved. Um, okay. We're going to try much on the south side as we can, um, but probably 60% of this area is, is going to be repaved in the front. And quite a lot of pavements can be removed also. But the driveway in, in this area, that'll all stay, not get repaved. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so we've got a couple of snow storage areas in the corners of the parking lot. Um, to, or I'm sorry, the green area in the middle of the parking space. Um, these are sort of situated here and here as to accommodate the, um, the landscaping too. So if these end up being insufficient, then um, Good Samaritan Haven will get the snow removed from, from the site as necessary. Um, and then we can talk about parking lot landscaping when we get to the landscaping section. So um, board has any other questions on parking and loading? Questions about parking and loading? Uh, yes, this is Josh. Please, Josh. Um, do the anticipated guests of the hotel have cars? I mean, is it, I, I apologize for my ignorance in the matter of this matter, but it seems to me that, that many of them would not have cars. Is that correct? That is correct. <clears throat> so, so, the, so the parking probably would not be, you're not going to have an issue with too many parking space you're going to have underused utilization probably of the parking spaces if it's used as a as a good as a shelter uh, perhaps under utilization we will have some um, you know visitors or collaborators and service partners could be there will be there during the day so um, yeah you're probably right if anything we'll probably underutilize <laughs> And at some point, it could be just run as a motel, couldn't it? I'm sorry, I missed that question. It's, it, it's intended to be used as a shelter for homeless individuals, but it could be converted to just, a, you know, you could change the clientele and, and work it, use it as a motel, couldn't you? I, I, yes, I mean, yes, we could go back to a uh, pay for, you know, a motel room operation. Right. Okay, thank you. Brian, how many existing parking spaces are there now? Uh, the best count I, I have, it's a little squishy, but I, I counted 21. So we would have the same amount of parking there proposed as existing. Thank you. Any other questions on parking or comments? If there are none, access to circulation. Great. Um, so uh, as I had mentioned previously, I'll go back to this bigger uh, plan to talk about this. Um, there's two existing curb cuts. Uh, we're proposing to maintain both curb cut locations, but reduce them both 24 feet in width. Um, given the current configuration of the site, um, it wouldn't. there's nowhere for emergency vehicles to turn around uh, once they enter the site. So we, we feel that we need to maintain both um, curb cuts for, um, you know, to provide a, a adequate access and circulation for emergency vehicles. Um, I, the project has been reviewed by VTrans and an LOI was issued recently. Um, hopefully members of the board have had a chance to, to take a look at that, although I'm, I have it and I'm happy to talk about it if there's any questions. Um, do, do, do. Both, both uh, accesses are proposed for two-way circulation and, and meet um, B71 standards. Um, and then there, uh, a fair amount of thought has been given to pedestrian and um, bicycle circulation with this site, um, particularly due to the, the population that we expect here. Um, so we will be providing um, bike parking uh, in this uh, landscaped area here. Um, proposing a, a sidewalk along the frontage, um, as well as a connection to the rest of the site. 
uh, and these sidewalks connect to a, a proposed bus stop location here in the southeast corner of the site um, that Good Samaritan Haven has been talking to GMTA about um, providing regular bus stop at this location. Um, in addition, uh, Good, Good Samaritan provides a, a van service that assists uh, folks And then we have we do have the stairs and sidewalk connection up to the up to the upper house there. Um, one thing that we should discuss, as as the board members probably noted in our narrative, um, we're proposing to only build the front end sidewalk along the section of the the lot that we're proposing to redevelop. Um, and we're requesting that construction of a sidewalk along this um, two hundred and fifty or seventy five foot section of um, sorry, 225 foot section of front along here um, be deferred until um, some further development happens on, on that portion of the lot. And maybe it's actually easier to see that on the landscaping plan where it's colored. Um, so these brown colors kind of where we're proposing to construct a uh, fronted sidewalk along the lot. What's the future development? Yeah. Well, it may depend. Um, I think there, there isn't a current plan for future development, um, like a specific plan for future development, although part of the intention in, in purchasing this lot was to try and do something with this section. So, um, you know, it, it's probably going to be a compatible use like low income housing that downstreet develops or not that I'm committing them to that um, or an additional motel building, if that need arises, um, that would be the kind of thing I would imagine. Um, although, as I said, no specific plan for development on that northerly portion of the lot yet. What What is to the right? I, I don't, I'm not sure what direction, right? Are we, we're not- uh, So what is to the right is the entrance to Route 63 up okay. here. Okay, so there's no development. To the right. There's yeah, there's no there's no directly adjacent development. There's not like another building up there, if that's what is you there mean. Any development alongside that? No. Okay. Yeah. So this everything back here is is Route 63 right away. Right. Okay. The the property oops the property line you can see the property line is just at the tree line here and then it's back in the trees uh, on this section here. So I have a question about the the two driveways in. Did you, Wait, say, did you say that um, they were both two way? Yeah, that's the intention is that they would be both two way. And why is that better than one way traffic? Um, it's a it's a busy corridor, and um, I find if you try and make something a one way loop, you often have people who miss the signage. Um, we're limited as to what signage we can put because it's the V-Trans right away. So it's, we can't put like a giant, like flashing turn here sign. Um, and so since we have enough room to have uh, 20 foot aisles, which are appropriate for two-way circulation, um, I think you'll have less traffic conflicts actually, if you can have folks enter at either um, drive in case they miss the one that they're supposed to turn in and then they're they're stuck going the wrong way around a one-way loop. And you don't anticipate a lot of tra traffic within the site, I take it, at, you know, at any one time. And no, I mean, um, don't have cars, so it's just you know the people who work with them. Right, and it's not it's not the kind of use that has like a peak uh, traffic, like a big office building where everyone gets out at five o'clock. Um, you know, even if it were operated as a motel, people would kind of be coming and going and, you know, maybe you'd get right. three people that arrive at the same time, but not, you wouldn't get like 20 people that arrive at the same time, typically. Brian, you asked, you answered one question for me, which Polly just asked, which is, did you give any consideration to one-way traffic? Um, uh, I was a little bit concerned about people popping out. What's the distance between the two driveways? Uh, let me measure it for you. Oops. 
I realize the station numbers on the um, highway plans, but. So inside to inside, 147 feet. Those are and I should note that when we were making them smaller, we were making them smaller by making them farther apart. So like the existing curb cut, um, let me get my handy dandy little red pen out. The existing curb cuts are here and here. Um, so we are trying to separate them as much as we can um, and improve safety while we're maintaining them. Based on your current facilities, do you have any sense of the volume of traffic you would expect? Um, Rick, I, I'd have to ask you to speak to that. Well, I, I wish I had a, a scientific basis to answer that question. Uh, I would say that uh, probably 10% of the motel guests might have vehicles. Our staffing would be on site but we don't have a huge staff, um, maybe uh, five or six staff members there at, at peak. Uh, so to me, the probably the, I, I think it's likely that we're talking around 10 cars there at, at, a, as a, at a busier point in time. Okay. Um, the one concern I had about circulation was um, the drive up to the uh, upper unit which now is a residence, but in the future will be an office and, and more than a residence. And that, that drive intersects uh, the entrance uh, practically within the first 15 feet. I'm a little concerned about people coming in and turning to the right or more, I'm really more concerned about people coming down the hill and then exiting. Um, yeah, so the, there is there is a that, that will be stop controlled coming down the hill. Yes, uh, probably not super, um, but so folks will have to stop here uh, as they're exiting, uh, and then they can go. In, you know, if it's clear, then they can go into the throat of the driveway, and then obviously stop again before entering on Route 302. Any thought given to making that just a right turn only? Coming down the hill. Uh, no, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. it just, just well, it, actually, uh, sorry. Let me back that up for a second. It may, be, it as I mentioned previously, it may be necessary for staff of Good Samaritan Haven to drive someone from the house back down to the motel. Uh, in which case, I don't think we'd want to force them to go out on Route 302 and come back. No, I, I, that's right. And what I said is right turn only. In other words. Oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I would, I'd be concerned about people coming down the hill from the upper unit and then trying to turn left. And there's only one car length there. Right. So, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't know if you no, thought not... But logistically, it, it, it seems to be a problem. I, I, you're not having that much traffic, but um, it, I just, if a car is coming in, there's almost no sight distance coming in before you're practically on top of each other. Yeah, good suggestion, Bob. Uh, I'm inclined to suggest that you, uh, anybody coming down the hill, is a right turn over. Yeah. You have a problem with that, Brian? No, nope, that's, that's all right with me. It, it forces them to go through the rest of the development, but on the other hand, I think Trying to come out of that, you know, I, I, I see that as a sort of a nasty little slide out. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, it's unfortunate because it's, it's hard to improve this intersection because of the grading without really, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty steep up here anyway. So it's difficult to rearrange this, um, well, but it, yeah. When it, was, when it was a resident only, I could see it not a problem, especially when the resident bond to the owners, but um, uh, when you have all the traffic going up and down, I, I think maybe we want to see that uh, traffic be routed to the right. Good idea. I think yep. um, suggestion. In other words, no left turn. Yep, agreed. 
I, I don't see that imposes a hardship on the applicant. We'll we'll tack one more sign up on the on the uh, on the pole. <laughs> and, and none of you, none of your um, uh, drawings show stop bars or anything like that. And I appreciate you in a hurry. Uh, but um, stop bars, signs, that stuff needs to be shown on these drawings. Uh, you, you, you've just testified you will be having stop bars there. Uh, I, I wasn't actually intending to have a stop bar there just because it's a really limited amount of traffic that comes up and down here. I mean, there's only three parking spaces uh, up there. So I felt it was adequate to just have the sign. But if if you would like a stop bar there, again, I'm well, not, not probably stop bar is not necessary, but a sign is necessary. In this case, I would like to see yep. another. Uh, I I think I mean, I'm open for suggestions, counter suggestions, but I think it would be useful if we did not allow traffic to come down the hill and then take a left. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I also I don't think a stop, some kind of stop, is not inappropriate because if cars coming in, people tend to get lazy coming down the hill. So I think it's a good idea to have you know a stop bar or a sign or something. Yeah, we had we had a stop sign proposed there at, at the bottom of the driveway here. Yeah. Uh, and we'll add either no left turn or right turn only, yeah. whichever is okay. appropriate under the METCD. Problem with stop bars, uh, Polly, is is the paint disappears within a couple of years. Sure, every winter. <laughs> um, any other questions on uh, circulation? Hey, this is tour. Any, yes, tour, go ahead. Um, getting back to the uh, bus stop, uh, you said there's a proposed one on um, you know, the side of the street is hotel. What about bus stops for the buses coming out of Barry? Um, would they be stopping on the other side of the road and pedestrians having to run across 302 or, or are you gonna make them stay on the bus you know, through the loop and all the way around till they come back or how's that gonna work? Yeah, I mean, the yeah. intention is, is not to get people to cross the road to get the bus. Um, so that's partly why um, Good Samaritan provides the van service as well. Um, but, you know, it, it may be that they have to do something like get the bus here and then take it down to like McDonald's where they can cross the road and get on the other side. I don't believe there's a bus stop on the other side of the road there. No, no in fact, there's no space for it. Can I, can I also add to the answer for that? Um, the other uh, service we have right now is the MyRide service from Montpelier. So, uh, you know, by arrangement, they will come to our site and return to uh, riders to uh, locations in uh, Montpelier and Berlin. So that's a huge advantage. And, um, and, um, and of course, people could walk down in the bike path to the crosswalk and cross over to the bus stop there down by the Burger King. It's, it's not that far. Um, and it's the only safe way to cross that road. Were there any discussions with VTRANS as far as putting in a crosswalk closer, either at the light of CVS or you know, somewhere closer than the uh, McDonald's? Uh, well, it wasn't it, it wasn't something they requested and I, I don't think there's really an appropriate place along the frontage of this particular property. <laughs> um, if you were going to put it anywhere, you'd put it at the light up here, but that would involve retiming the light and and it would be a, a VTrans project because it'd be totally within their right of way. Right. Um, you know, folks could if you needed to, like Rick was saying, walk in the bike lane. Um, which I understand is an ideal um, down to the McDonald's here in the Burger King where there are bus stops on both sides of the road and appropriate crosswalks. Thank you. Yeah, ultimately we'd like to see the whole Route 302 core to be a lot more pedestrian friendly, um, but I'm not sure that this application prompts that. Right. Uh, to start in the right direction. Is everyone all right with the applicant only making a putting sidewalk in front of the new improved area? Yes. I think, I mean, there's nothing to connect it to the, the other direction. 
but I heard that there's a condition that with future development, it'll be yeah. further. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and of course, any future development will be back in front of the board for review anyway, and you'll get another chance to um, review but, the pedestrian circulation at that time. I don't think it's a bad idea to have a condition here though, because the so that the future development is not necessarily necessarily responsible for a sidewalk in front of this property. Brian, that sidewalk's entirely within the right of way of the um, state of Vermont, is it not? It is, yes. Okay. Brian, I sent you that our now standard agreement. So this, so it, I don't know if you've spoken to your client about that. Select board is, has it on their agenda for June 21st. I think it would be appropriate for, for you folks to sign that agreement and, and get a signed copy so they have it for, for themselves on the 21st. Yep, and we did discuss it um, and that, that should not be a problem. So we can get it to you for that select board meeting. Were you planning on marking uh, uh, the, um, what do you plan on doing at the, where the crosswalk uh, crosses the entrance way? Are you planning on putting a, a marking for the pedestrian crossing? Um, we, I am not showing it, but certainly we can, yes. I believe that was kind of a condition of VTRANS, but I, I'm because you know, they don't talk about the manual for manual for uniform track control track control devices. Excuse me, um, and I believe that requires it. You have a sidewalk and you have a crosswalk across the driveway. You mark it. Yep. Uh, certainly, the one where there's a sidewalk on both sides. Yeah, the other one does right. not have a sidewalk on both sides. Anything else on access and circulation? Um, if not, landscaping and screening. Yes, uh, so we have Paul Simon here, who's the landscape architect for the project. Um, and I am going to get the plan pulled up and then ask him to describe the landscaping design. Thanks, Brian. Hello, everybody. Um, oh. Hi. So basically what we've done is followed the regulations on the landscape requirements. And if you look at the, how we listed it out in the upper right hand corner of the landscaping sheet, um, we first started off with the front yard landscaping and, and we uh, took the measurement of the 343.3 feet and you know, show the required trees and then uh, the provided uh, required trees and provided trees with the exception, of course, of the waiver area that we just discussed for the sidewalk. We're asking for the same thing on the landscaping. So if you can see towards the bottom of the sheet where we actually decided to take that street tree landscaping and the shrubs across the, the curb cut um, from VTRANS to the right a little bit so we can maintain some of that character, but then end it at some point. And so we're less than a sidewalk, but we're about 222 feet from what I counted um, from that marking where the waivers requested. We provided an image of that in the upper left-hand corner, but as you all may be familiar, much more familiar to, at, of the site than I am, the character of that open green is just spectacular as it is. So we feel that trying to maintain that street tree presence would actually detract from what you currently have. Um, so we'd like to maintain that and are requesting the same waiver that they are for the sidewalk, we are for the landscaping. So when we go back to the uh, frontage uh, street tree requirements, we deducted that 222 feet and we're, for the rest of the site, we're, we're showing the required uh, street trees. So we have for frontage trees and frontage shrubs, we have the FT and the FS indicated. And that's, you know, just showing what your regulations require and then what we're providing. So we're providing at least that minimum amount. So we have the seven street trees that are required. Uh, we have uh, a minimum requirement of 35 um, 
of you know front yard shrubs we have 40 um, and then after the frontage uh, front yard landscaping requirements we have the um, the next section calls for building perimeter calculations and then we calculate the perimeter of the buildings and then you have a required number of shrubs that are required for for those building found uh, building shrubs and that's what the bs is indicated there so we have 58 required shrubs there and we're showing um 84 and we show that same symbol throughout the plan where the bs tr uh, shrubs are um and then in addition you have a parking lot landscape calculation requirement for uh parking lot trees and parking uh, depending on the number of parking spaces, you have also parking shrub requirement as well. So we have um, met as well. We have, um, I guess, uh, five minimum required trees. We're showing six and three minimum shrubs. We're showing 15 there. So we provided a legend as well to show the front yard trees, the front yard shrubs, the building shrubs required, the parking area trees required, and the parking shrubs required and we felt because we are working quickly on this that placing all the regulation requirements right on the plans would be helpful to you. So we have additional landscaping there as well. So if it's not in a box that sh shows what's required, it's there like we have the wildflower, Northeast wildflower mixture on the tighter slope because we feel that's a little bit tighter than, uh, than to mow. And we thought that that would be attractive and that's kind of the backdrop to that area that um, uh, that small plaza where, where the seating wall is. So we thought that'd be nice. And we have additional uh, shrubs and perennials on the plan as well. So I'm happy. Oh, in addition, there's a screening requirement too for areas that have, um, uh, you know, like um, uh, dumpsters and enclosures and things like that. There's actually some on the, north, on the property south of this. So we thought adding some hemlock trees and, and um, some uh, a large landscaping uh, planter space there would be good for that. Um, so um, yeah, here happy to answer any questions on it. Mr. Tour, go ahead. Um, are there any um, line of sight issues either exiting this property onto the highway or? Uh, Tool from tool warehouse. Yeah, so we didn't show the triangular uh, cones, but they'd be actually further out because you'd pass the sidewalk. So our, our landscaping is not even in the V transit. It's it's back on the property, and okay. so, so that frontage is there. You know, on on I guess the property side of that sidewalk, so it wouldn't be in, in any conflict. And what we also did was make sure the shrubs are further in from those curb cuts as well, so. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question for Rick, but first of all, I'd like to say it's a nice plan. It's, you, you do nice work. The, so the, the, the common area to the right that we don't see, or it's not a common area, it's a, an area you don't want to, to address with landscaping. It, it, will it be a common area with maybe picnic tables and something else or a, some, a, a gazebo structure or something out there or uh, I mean will there be children living at this site uh, would be a pretty pretty neat facility for those kids if you had some sort of fence or something blocking it off from the the, the highway I just what's your thoughts for that that common space I, I think that people are going to naturally go there and, and you're talking. Uh, um, are you referring to the uh, the big grassy area there? Yes. It's, what, what's it's what's up by there now, Rick? Yes. Well, I hadn't actually. I mean, when I think of people relaxing um, on the site outside, I think of it more uh, uh, on the main part of the site behind the motel buildings, or I believe we even have a little patio behind the house as well. Um, so my mind has more gravitated in that direction. And um, I mean, and, and the other advantage of that is there's some buffering from the traffic on, on Route 302. Um, so so I don't, we didn't have any plans or really any discussion about encouraging 
recreation over there. And to answer your question about children, uh, no, this is adults only on this site. Nice bocce ball court. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got that right, yeah. Touch Bob, the ball, all kinds say, of things. I'm saying Pee Wee football, yeah. Yeah. Josh? I say, yeah, I, I, I think um, Tom's point is a good one in terms of, you know, what the ambience of the area is for. I understand there's no real, you know, you don't want to have to do all of the landscaping in there, particularly if you're thinking of, of redeveloping that and then having to take that landscaping yeah. out. But, but, you know, just making it, putting a few benches in just someplace where people could sit, I guess. And, and, and I, I don't know what, whether there's any way to buffer the noise of the, of the highway um, to create a little bit more privacy in that spot, but, it, but it's, it's unusual and to find a, a grassy flat space on this property, which is otherwise pretty hilly once you start going behind the, uh, the motel and climbing the hill, yeah. so. So I should point out that there, we are intending to put some seating on the patio here in between. And then there's a, a significant flat lawn in between the top of these stairs and the house, um, as well as they're planning to do some patios and things out behind the building. Um, so, you know, there, there are spaces that are provided for people to gather on, on this portion of the site. Um, and even though this is a big grassy flat area, it's, it's not that pleasant to stand in just because cars are going by close to you all right. the time. Yeah. So, um, you know, our intention is to provide outdoor gathering space, but we're not going to probably put it, we're not, I don't think we're going to encourage people to go over on this part of the site. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I personally don't think it would be a good idea. It's, 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 it's really not a, um, suitable for this project to start thinking about how to use that area when we, without giving due consideration to how people access it and, and, and what the considerations are on with regard to 302. Um, hey Josh, Josh, Tom Bachman here. One thing we had talked about, Paul Simon has done a really nice job, I think, landscaping this island, uh, you know, it's out in front. And because we've got screening between the sidewalk and the Barry Montpelier Road, we had always envisioned there could easily be a couple picnic tables out there uh, because it's kind of a self-contained area and I could see people deciding to gather there too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice idea. Yeah. Okay. The area also at the, at the top that Brian pointed out is pretty large in front of the residents and the elevation remember is quite different. And so the views up there are, incredible so that's another good spot as well so and I, i'd encourage people to use spaces like the, these two instead that that are a little bit more buffered and away from the vehicular activities so okay um we're we're getting on here so i'm gonna try to move this along there's no further questions on landscaping and screening i do think paul did a very nice job with this mm -hmm. um and what are you doing later tonight <laughs> um, my yard's a mess, but uh, <laughs> uh, but no. Uh, any other questions on landscaping? No. Um, I think it's reasonable to uh, uh, not landscape that 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 northerly section uh, in light of the fact it's not being developed at this time. And frankly, it looks the, the existing owner has done a very nice job of maintaining the landscaping he does have. Um, outdoor lighting. Uh, so uh, we're proposing uh, six pole, 16 pole lights, uh, which are located, uh, let me zoom in a little bit, uh, indicated with number one uh, on the plan. Uh, so there's uh, three that are, are lighting the parking lot and then three that light the, uh, the driveway up to the, to the, uh, the existing residence. Um, there'll be new, uh, there's a porch along the front of the motel, so there'll be new lighting uh, underneath the roof of the porch here, which is indicated with number three. Um, and then uh, going up the stairs, um, inside the railings on the stairs, there's gonna be some LED strip lighting um, that's, that's inserted into the bottom of the railing um, just to provide some, some safety lighting for going up and down the stairs um, at night. Um, the, let's see, uh, all the exterior uh, lighting will be LED, um, warm color temperature, downcast and cut off or mounted under overhangs. Um, pole lights are mounted at 18 and a half feet above grade um, and average light levels in the parking and the drive areas are 1.1 to 1.6 foot candles. Um, 
we are proposing to control the lighting with both a photo cell and a timer. Um, so they'll turn on at dusk based on the photo cell. Um, and then at 11 p.m., we'll have them dim to 50% on the timer. Um, and just due to the nature of this um, use, we would like to keep the lighting at 50% um, for the remainder of the night, just so there's some um, visibility on the site. Did you have a lighting site plan? Uh, there's this that shows the lights, then there's also a photometric plan as well. Yeah. You do have a photo? Okay, you do, okay. Yep. Um, any reason you didn't submit that? I believe that we did. Did we did not get it? There is some lighting stuff. Yeah, it was certainly, it was certainly our intention to submit it. And if you didn't get a copy, then that was um, just an error on our part. Yeah. No, there's a number of plans that aren't here that could have been here. Yeah. Oh, I apologize about that. Yeah. I I thought that you had what I had. Sorry, 43 years of engineering um, <laughs> comes in here. Um, yeah, it's uh, while, I'm, while I'm asking that question, did you have an existing condition site plan? Uh, we did not prepare an existing conditions plan for this particular site. I'm, I'm accustomed to you doing that. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm also accustomed to it. <laughs> <laughs> I looked for oh. it. <laughs> yeah, as I said, this particular project, we were under some immense time pressure because of the funding um, being the first round of, of COVID money, which has a, a deadline of occupation by the end of this year. Um, and so it's, it's been a very compressed timeline to um, what we usually would like for a project like this. So uh, yes, if there are things that you used to getting and then I typically provide and you didn't get them I apologize it's, it's just well since you do have not... this plan the photometric plan would, would, you, would you please provide that yeah absolutely and again I'm sorry that you don't already have it I, I yeah. was under the impression the, exist, the problem with these without an existing condition site plan it was difficult to see what you were demolitioning and what you weren't well I I, I looked on the Google Maps <laughs> for the existing yeah. Yeah, but if you hadn't had that available to you, you'd be hard pressed to figure out what's going right. on. Understood. Um, uh, any questions on lighting? Comments on lighting? Uh, this is Josh. Just a comment. I like the the plan to dim the lights at night. I mean, frequently we've struggled with the notion of having lights on or off, but dimming them is makes it you know, a good suggestion to you know cut things down. You'll still have some light for critical uh, you know needs but not as much as you would have uh, throughout the night. So good suggestion, or good recommendation. Um, signs, I understand you'll be applying for that at a later date. Um, do you anticipate having one sign, multiple signs, just out of curiosity? Um, I don't know that we have crossed that bridge yet. Uh, maybe Rick or Nicola, if you know more about that than me. That's fine. That's fine. We don't need it. We don't need to speculate. Uh, I thought you might already have a plan. Um, performance standards. Um, yeah, we're not anticipating any significant impacts under the under the performance standards. Okay. Um, I note it under erosion control and stormwater treatment. Uh, yep. So um, there's. Uh, other than the front, there, not a lot of the site is getting disturbed, um, so we will be under an acre of disturbance, but the project will follow the um, low risk, the ANR low risk site handbook. Um, the site is designed um, to have a reduction of impervious surfaces, so we're, we're essentially improving the stormwater situation here by just um, removing uh, parking anywhere we can that, that's not needed and, and transferring it over to landscaped and um, other pervious areas. Now, as you're aware, we already have a stormwater problem on the Barremont Clear Road. Where, where, where does the stormwater go? Uh, the stormwater goes into the, the closed drainage system under Route 302. So essentially, it all drains down to this uh, disconnection that V-Trans Assets put in and then into their closed drainage system. And that really, that, that open 
connection does not really provide any detention, does it? Minimal. Yeah. Um, you are reducing the amount of impervious area. Uh, is all of it go into those uh, into that storm drain system, or does other flow in other directions? Um, there is like there's a section of the driveway over here. Um, well, no, actually, no, because of B seventy one, where it flowed directly onto the road before, we're now collecting it and sending it into the closed drainage system. So um, there is a swale behind the motel um, that cuts off the stuff coming down the hill, um, but that eventually ends up. In, it, in the closed drain system as well um, through an existing culvert on this portion of the site. Um, the undeveloped portion of the site, I think will continue to drain um, directly onto the roadway. I don't believe there's any um, stormwater structures over in that area. How many acres in purpose area do you have total? That is a good question. Uh, less than one, but I don't have the number right offhand. You, you think the total impervious area is less than one acre? I believe it is. Let me see if I could find that number for you real quick. This may take a minute. Or it might be. I mean, I think it's, it's fine that it's all going into the, the storm drain system that um, eventually ends up in the state of Vermont system, but um, uh, we do have a problem with excess stormwater drainage on the Barry Montpelier Road. So I'm just trying to see. I didn't see, yeah. I didn't see any real opportunities for you to do anything about that. Yeah, it's, it's, an, and it's another one of those sites where the grade comes right down to the road with, with little opportunity for, um, for yeah. really um, adding a lot of treatment, um, which is why I said it was our intention to reduce the amount of storm water, or, uh, impervious area on the site. Oh, you know where I might have it? Sorry, I'm... I am uh, scratching through my files here because I know I have it written down somewhere. It wasn't in your testimony, so. No, it wasn't. Let's see, I think this is a bit old, but it may While give we're us waiting, sense. While we're waiting, Rick, is this subject to Act 250? No. No, it is not. We've had a determination on that, correct? Yes, we have. Um, well, that, that's all right. It was it was a, it was meant to be a casual question. It wasn't direct. Uh, uh, <laughs> you are you are decreasing you are decreasing the amount of previous area, yeah. and that that that's is it. appreciated. Um, I didn't know if there's anything else we could do, and I mean, there's some opportunities to do some stuff with that open area to the to the north. Uh, but it would have to reroute a lot of stormwater to get there. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know because there's limited drainage structure along 302, especially to the north there, you bring, basically have to bring it over there and bring it back. And I'm not sure how physically feasible that would be. Um, also, I, I thought under this criteria, don't we have impact on community? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, we do have comments from the police chief. Did you did you reach out to the uh, chief of police? Uh, You're muted, Rick. Yep. Yes, uh, we've talked several times, and uh, we also discussed that question at uh, two select board meetings. And I provided the uh, select board with um, some statistics on police calls from our other facilities and um, as a way of addressing that. Right, but you're talking to the DRB now. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure what your question is, actually. Well, uh, it, I was asking really, what, what, what is the impact? 
Uh, on this criteria, I, I'm, I'm now scratching here. I, I could maybe speak to this a little bit, Bob. I, I think uh, Chief Pontrevon uh, didn't provide written testimony. I, he met with Rick several times uh, on this project. I, I attended some of the select board meetings where Rick and uh, uh, the chief spoke. Uh, and the concerns was you know, the impact that the, that the hilltop has. And my sense, speaking to the chief, that he, he is he is significantly more pleased with this um, effort here than what's happening at the hilltop. And uh, he, but he, I don't believe he's he supplied any written testimony to that end. And do we have any comments from the fire department? Did you reach out to the fire department? I did. Yep. You did. I did, and I did. When I did not receive anything. <clears throat> building codes. Um. Are there requirements for sprinkler systems? Uh, I'm not sure what the requirements are, but we are planning to sprinkle all three buildings. Okay. And we did do a walk through the project with the state fire marshal. We did. With Stan Baranowski. And what size main serves the um, project area for sprinklers? Well, the existing owners had the foresight uh, a few years ago to have a six inch main uh, drilled under Route 302. So there's already an existing six inch water main from the Montpelier system on the property. Um, so essentially we're just gonna extend that to, to the three buildings. And good Sam reached out and um, acquired additional wastewater allocation from the public sort right. board. I saw that. So you have the additional allocation for water and water also? Water is water, water's coming from in Montpelier, but we're in the process of, of getting allocation from them. Okay. As well as you are. Because it would, oh. would seem to me that the existing development was under allocated for both water and sewer. Yeah, it did certainly seem that way. Yeah. This is Tor. Uh, yeah. Tor, yes, go ahead. Um, any discussions with Berrytown EMS, uh, the ambulance provider? There's any possible increase in calls. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the residents are probably not in the uh, best of health, especially like in the winter, uh, in an emergency case, you know, possible hypothermia and frostbite and pneumonia and things like that. Well, we didn't specifically speak to them about this project. We have a good working relationship with them and that uh, we know them. And um, um, I mean, it, you know, that that question, I mean, our first, the most important thing we can do is keep in touch with what people's health and wellness is. I don't want to rely on emergency services to address things that can be addressed otherwise. But there are certainly instances when that happens, people are gonna be living there. So. Okay. They're close to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bob, Bob? Yes. I just wanna to clarify, Tom, you did send us an email that came from the chief. Chief Pomfrion? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Can you refresh just my memory? Can he you just refresh? says he, he says he's spoken to the director at length and he his concerns were addressed basically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That he doesn't see any kind of issues we have, that he doesn't see the kind of issues that we he would he's seeing at the at the, at the hilltop. He doesn't anticipate that. That's what I re reiterated. That was my memory. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. And and as I understand it, there's no smoking allowed on the or in within the buildings. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything further you want to add to this um, testimony? Uh, I'm a set. Unless uh, Rick, uh, you have anything else you'd like to say? Uh, I, gee whiz! I wish I had something really stunning to say at this point. Other than we really your consideration. We know that this is a special case and um, uh, we're trying to put forward a real uh, project that's going to be a true, you know, a, a asset to the community and uh, that the impact will be a positive impact and not a negative impact. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay. Um, questions by the board? Megan Brown, did you have anything else you wanted to speak to where you, you've been attending today? Morgan Brown. Morgan Brown. Uh, nothing. <laughs> no, I'm just observing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I just want to say on behalf of the town of Berlin, it's, uh, thank you for your effort you put forth. You guys reached out uh, very, very early in, in this process, and it's much appreciated. Um, thank you. If there is um, no other questions um, uh, for the applicant, I would entertain a motion to close this hearing. This is true. So moved. Second, Josh. Holly's hand raised. Uh, discussion on that motion. All those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Uh, this hearing is closed. We thank you very much all for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one other item of business for our meeting tonight. Two other items. What? Oh, yeah, we have two other items. Um, uh, uh, let me deal first with the minutes of the meeting of June 1. Um, uh, I had made some comments on I can't remember if uh, others did, but I know that Christy went ahead and revised it to reflect comments. Oh, yes. Uh, any, com any other comments or questions with regard to the minutes of June 1? Motion to approve. I move this to tour. Tour. Second. Second by Polly. Discussion? All those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And the minutes as revised uh, are approved. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, Tom would like to discuss an item with us tonight. Uh, go ahead, Tom. The uh, governor's yeah. order yesterday, the, uh, uh, we're, we're required to, to meet in person again. So to, today, today was a test run of that. Uh, we'd encourage all board members, if they are so inclined, to meet in person. Minimum requirements are one staff member and one um, committee member at the meeting. Uh, so at the next, at the next, uh, Developer Review Board meeting. It will be a, a live session, but we'll continue to have a, a Zoom feed of a v hybrid meeting. So I'm just letting you know that and, and hope you can join us here. Any thoughts on that? I'll be there. I knew the day would come. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I'm, it may be easier for me to participate by Zoom than it did to attend, but... Um, well, as uh, long as it's hybrid, you can do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, think we, I think we've learned something here that um, we can do hybrid. Uh, yeah. We've still got some technological issues we're coping with, uh, but we'll get there. How, how is this new system working for you guys? Good. Fine. I think it's good. So... Um, yeah, so the next meeting will be a, a regular scheduled open meeting, uh, but um, so probably people responding ought to let us know whether they'll be responding by attending by Zoom or attending in person. Okay. It'd be helpful for us to know that. Um, uh, Are you going, you're going to require at least all those who attend in person have their vaccinations, right? Uh, that is not a requirement. It's not a requirement. Really? Okay. No. But I, I would certainly hope that you have. <laughs> I have, but I just didn't, you know. Yeah. Can, can, so can you, if someone, if the presenter is in the room, can they still share the screen with the people that are, how does that work? Uh, they would have to bring a laptop, mute themselves on it. And though we were having a little bit of difficulty with that earlier tonight, it's something we'd have to, to work through. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and they, they, they would not be sharing a screen if they're here in person, right? Well, that's what I'm wondering is how people at home 
I'm yeah. wondering how people on people Zoom will see. see the screen. Yeah, see the screen. Like they, they show up here. <laughs> I mean, worst case scenario is they'll have an exhibit to present on a, on a, on a board. A yeah. better case scenario would be there'd be a way to put it on it with share with a share function. I, yeah. I guess I, I think I've been in other meetings with Zoom where there's that we've accomplished that. Okay. I, I'd have to scratch back. I didn't do it. Trust me. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, well, yeah. I don't think that the presenters, you know, they're most of them are professionals. They most of them would know how to do that. Yeah, the question is, do do we? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> it, it takes really two people if you're going to do something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I guess there will be occasions where some of us will want to attend uh, remotely. Yeah. And rather than just be on a telephone, I think it's a heck of a lot easier if we can do it with Zoom. So. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Telephone doesn't work really. No. You feel separated. At least Zoom, you can see people. No. These screens, um, so, yeah, but we can work. We can work out the bugs. I, you know, other towns are doing this too. So I, I'm, pl I'm planning on attending future meetings. Um, and as you see, I, I, I thought I'd come up here tonight as a trial. Yeah, that's good. Um, so, um, I had one other thing I just wanted to mention in passing. If if we have no further discussion on that item, um. Uh, I'm going to be, I've been asked to uh, attend a select board meeting uh, as chair in, on the 21st to talk about how things are going with the DRB. So they, the select board is, um, and as Carla knows this already, select board is trying to meet with every, every board or every chair of every board and committee that they have and just see, see how things are going. So um, uh, I'm letting you know that it, 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 and the agenda will be out from the select board. Uh, uh, I think it's 7.40 or something like that, that night. Um, I'm on the agenda to speak to that. I'll be speaking to that and also the Regional Planning Commission and the Regional Transportation Advisory Committee. But uh, uh, Good. Good. Everybody, everybody feels like joining us uh, via Zoom or, or in person. person, let us know. Okay. Okay. Well, you're welcome to join. I don't pretend to speak for the whole board. Okay. Um, deliberative session. What's that? Deliberative session. Yeah. Uh, would we like to go into a deliberate session on this application tonight? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, no, we wouldn't. Wristwatch. <laughs> I move that we go into deliberate session. <laughs> I second that. We have a motion and a second to go into deliberate session. Um, all those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, I have opposed. Oh. We're going to remove the media. Can we have a quick bathroom break? <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> uh, see. Yeah. That is one of the disadvantages of being here, is you can't just, you know. I know. Come left, do. That is adjourned. <laughs> They're back. Huh? They're back. Yeah. So is there any other business coming before this board tonight? No. no. Motion to adjourn. If, if there, there you go. Second. Motion has been made to adjourn by Carla, second by Polly. I just, oh, there's no discussion. I keep doing that. Um, all those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose the motion. And we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah.